up first. If this is what I think, I am restocking, yes, potentiometers, trimmer pots. I've been using a lot of these sometimes on a single board. This one uses eight of them that I just assembled, so it doesn't take long to run out. So I think there's 50 in here overall, and they are packaged well. So let's see what we have here. It says 103, so that's a one, no, 10k pot. One zero followed by three zeros. So these are going to go into the part tray and probably get used up soon. Now this is some cables. So since I've been using these a lot, this specific one that I keep ordering has been serving me well, so I just st thought I'd stock up on <laughs> USB-C cables. A couple of months ago there was a craze where it seemed a lot of people kept getting these in mail bags that they ordered. So I thought I'm going to get some multicolors here to add to the ones I've already got. I have some black ones and white ones. Can't remember if I have other colors. But like this one, when you have a couple of ESP modules or something all tangled up on the workbench, and you need to pull the cord on one of them up near a hub, it's good to be able to color code and just identify which is the correct cable. So I ordered these from the same seller I got the others, and I expect they'll do just as well. Some more restocking of something I already bought before and made good use of. These little through-hole PCB test points in various colors. Using this PCB again as an example. Here I'm using one of those yellow test points. There's a purple one and a light blue one. And those are good for hooking on a scope probe and taking measurements. So it's good to have various colors. Red and black are good for power ground and then to identify different kinds of signals if necessary. Multicolors. And there's seven items here. They're all from the same category. I ordered them recently. They all came relatively quickly. I'm just going to open all these at once, then we'll see what's going on. 600 ohm to 600 ohm transformers. A couple of those phone line slick modules, subscriber line interface circuit, KS0835F, which I've used before on a breakout module for phone line experimenting, as well as I had it on an ESP8266 prototype larger circuit with a phone line experiment I was doing. So now I'm going to do the ESP32 version where I need two identical boards and each one needs a phone line controller. So I have two of these modules. That way I don't have to rip them off of this, because I still use this for breadboarding, so restocking for a near-term project. Oh, they're loose. <laughs> 74HC4050. Those are hex buffers that can be powered by 3.3 volts, but have 5 volt tolerant inputs. And in the datasheet, it actually says they can be used for level translating 5 volt inputs down to 3.3 volt. So dealing with a 3.3 volt GPIO on ESP32 and dealing with older telephone hardware, I have a DTMF decoder chip that only works at 5 volts. So I'm going to send its outputs through this buffer, level translate it to 3.3. And these 600 ohm impedance matching transformers are to hook up on the phone jack of this whole project so we can have isolation between boards and still pass audio signals no problem. On the topic of DTMF decoding chips, which I believe the part number is MT8870, that chip uses 3.58 megahertz crystals. So I needed to make sure I had enough of these to build a couple of boards at a minimum without having to pull these off of other existing hardware. So that should be 
good for what I need. This is a bunch of relays. These are double pull, double throw with five volt coils. So on a five volt system, like parts of this phone system, I can turn one of these on with a transistor and switch the phone line tip and ring over to one of these transformers to connect an off-board external phone network to this board. And I used this same part on the old prototype, so I know it does what I need, and I just ordered more so I could have enough. You can't hook things up to a phone unless you have a sufficient quantity of phone jacks. I've used countless phone jacks on various things. I have a separate breakout board with just a phone jack and some headers for a breadboard, and I have several of these slick module breakout boards. So I needed to make sure I have more phone jacks to complete this upcoming project. And that should do for now. And the last item in this particular bunch of items here, Schottky Diode 1N5817, assuming they sent the right part and that it's a legitimate part. I don't know if that's showing up, but it does say 1N5817. So usually I see 1N5819 used when a design needs some sort of a power rectifier type thing with the low shot key forward voltage. And I can't remember the exact specs, but I think the 1N5819 has a higher current capability. This has less current capability, but this one, I believe, will have a lower forward voltage drop for a given current that I am going to work with, several hundred milliamps. So what I want to do is use this in series with a 5 volt supply for reverse polarity protection with minimum voltage loss for that DTMF decoder chip because it has a minimum voltage spec of 4.75 volts. So if I have a 5 volt regulator and I need a diode in line with its output, I want to still make sure after the diode I can get at least 4.75 volts to power that chip correctly. So I thought I would give this a try. I'm sure I can use these for lots of other purposes as well. So at this point, we're not done opening the mail yet, but I will say thanks to channel and Patreon supporters for helping make all these kind of purchases possible. I did buy some other stuff, so stuff for my other hobbies, but it will tie into electronics. So I thought I would include here the fact that I went guitar shopping. Both of these I basically discovered accidentally by watching various YouTube videos. And this first one is a Telecaster Style by M Musi. So it's made in China. It's available on Amazon. And when I stumbled on this one, I saw all kinds of positive reviews, both in videos and in forums. So I decided to take a chance on it and checking the intonation, just playing the 12th fret note and the 12th fret harmonic. They sound close enough for getting started before making any adjustments. So that means the guitar will be relatively in tune across the whole neck. The second one I got is also made in China, and it comes from China from AliExpress. I saw this guitar in several videos from several different sellers between eBay and AliExpress, and they're not all going to be identical, but basically I bought a Chipson, which is a Chinese fake Gibson. Perfectly in tune right out of the box. Because one of the things I plan to do is basically upgrade everything on it over time. Change out the tuners, the pickups, the bridge. One of the main concerns people have is if people buy this cheap, 
and then they try to sell it to somebody as a real guitar made from another company, well, that's not good. But first of all, I plan to have this thing indefinitely, but also I'm going to do something like scratch in or burn in the word fake. So this was selling for around 400 Canadian, and that's free shipping. And the particular store I got this from has coupon codes available, at least when I bought it. So then getting it into the country, it took a couple of days less than a month. So from the day I placed the order, it took about a week until it actually had a tracking number that it was being shipped. And then it was just a couple of weeks and it got through customs relatively fast and it cost $33 and something to get it through duty and taxes. And another reason I, I'm not so concerned about anyone ever mistaking this for a real one, this is a fake version of the Greeny Les Paul which is a 1959 that was originally owned by Peter Green and it ended up being sold to Gary Moore and it went to some collectors, at least one of them. Eventually now it landed with Kirk Hammett. This particular version has been relicked, which means when Gibson made the reproductions, they intentionally age it and recreate all of the original paint wear and any other dings and scratches. And the reason there's no concern about anyone ever thinking this is a real one that's been relicked, anyone who's got the budget to be shopping for one of these should know what they're looking at. I do have a real Gibson Les Paul traditional, a 2010 model. So I'm just going to take that and look side by side at some of the general Gibson traits and see how this one looks against it. Here they are side by side, and even though they're not the same model or made of the same materials necessarily, just for comparison, my traditional is about nine pounds, one or two ounces, and the fake greeny, seven pounds, 12 or 13 ounces. One thing I noticed here, this pickup selector switch is on a little loose, so it needs to be rotated in position and tightened up. Otherwise, it doesn't feel, of course, as high quality as the original kind of switch, but if I replace it, doesn't matter. One of the things they replicated on the greeny is the two pot knobs on the left are different from the two on the right, as opposed to all looking identical, so that's a replication they did. A lot of people talk about having to replace the bridge, but I'll, I'll just have to see how things go. And the pickups, people usually say how not great they are. Sometimes they talk about them being microphonic, so they easily squeal. Like if you put a microphone up against a PA and it just goes crazy. I'll have to see how that is. Otherwise, this relicking, like along here, this is where your arm would be resting. So over time, that would wear out. And apparently this here, this mark, would be from picking, whether with fingers, scraping it with fingernails over time, or a pick itself, I don't know. But that's one of the distinctive markings. So on the back where this paint is all worn away and there's all these little dings here from whatever happened and of course along the edge here it's just general aging. So again not really being much of a demo person just to see if all the stuff is hooked up properly and works. I'll try this out.
So before I become some sort of collector, I think I should watch some videos on how to play instead of what to buy. There's a couple of reasons I think I was inspired to get some guitars. I want to learn how to maintain them for one thing, so if I ever need to do some work on this real Gibson that's more expensive, maybe I can practice on this one. And even working on the Telecaster, I just want to be more familiar with things, including if I ever need to replace frets. I don't want to have my first attempt being on this more expensive unit. And I'm also planning to do more guitar effect circuits, or even just things like guitar signal switching circuits. So I'm expanding the electronics hobby again out into music and electronics.